How come you described yourself once as a, you said you were a Platonist? What is because, that? Because, so the notion of, of being a Platonist, and even Plato wasn't as much a Platonist as the ones who followed him, yeah. right? But this whole idea of Platonism simply means that, that there is truth in mathematics, that nature is mathematical, that if you want to understand the hidden code of nature, you have to do it through mathematics and only through mathematics. And did you used to believe that? Was that your Yes, philosophy? because it's a very compelling idea because you see, when you say two plus two equals four, there's some finality to that statement. Yeah. You know, you can hold that and say, I know that, right? Mm. And that gives you a sense of safety, of security, right? So you don't want flakiness when you're trying to pursue, you know, the quest of understanding everything. You want the most <laughs> profound kind of truth that you can find. And so if math can give you that, right. you embrace it with all your might, right? And, and art that, has, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and lots of lots of mathematicians and lots of physicists yeah. believe that. You know, believe that the fundamental core of nature yeah. is essentially pure mathematics. And you're saying you've moved away from that. You don't believe that anymore. No, I don't believe that anymore. I think that mathematics is a human invention. It's oh. a product of how we evolved in this very specific planet to make sense of things and to survive. So there are certain things in mathematics which are definitely true, right? So if you're an intelligence that can count, you know, one, two, three, four, then you can develop the sense of a set of integer numbers and from there you can go on and do other things, right? But there may be intelligences that do not count, yeah. right? So if you're a little blob, I think there's this famous mathematician from England called Michael Atiyah, who had this image of this intelligent blob that lived at the bottom of the ocean. It was dark, it didn't move, it didn't have to collect any food, the food would just come to it from, from above, right? And all it sensed was the flow of currents. So this intelligence was created a super sophisticated hydrodynamics, you know, the physics of fluids and how they move about, but it would not count because there was nothing to count unless it could hear its own heartbeat or something like that, right? So the fact that you're intelligent does not mean that you have to create the integers. You know, it really depends on the context in which you evolved. So there is this well, link. you say that if this blob never saw that's a that's a, a lack that it had it lacked it right yeah. so i'm not convinced by it because surely the it, prime numbers would still be prime even though this what creature if there are no primes them. there are no numbers you know, so, you, so, so if okay, you don't I've experience them <laughs> if, if you don't experience numbers then you may not you may or may not be able to cope with them but that doesn't mean that they don't exist it exists to whom right i mean to that blob it exists and that's all that matters and you would know a lot about plasticity and shapes yeah. and deformed mm -hmm. shapes continuous that's quite radical, isn't it? my dog doesn't know about uh, <laughs> prime numbers but that doesn't mean they don't exist right right it's because right. It, it lacks the intelligence or maybe the experience of them where do they exist yeah I don't, who knows right? they, I they, asked they, this yeah, question yes, and they laughed right, at right. me <laughs> i think maybe that's a, i mean i think they're non-empirical realities right but what's wrong with that Right. Right. Wait a what's a non-empirical reality? Well, something that you, that you don't need to measure in order to know that it's true. For example, in physics, so Roger Penrose gave us the idea of complex numbers or imaginary numbers, mm -hmm. right? So it's a very strange, surely looks like an invented thing, the square root of minus one. But it, it turns out that it had all this surprising richness to it that in eventually allowed us to formulate quantum mechanics in that language. So the argument is that you have something that seems very abstract and made up, but then it turns out to have a life of its own. Right. And then not only does it have a life of its own, but it ends up being able to describe things about the physical world that you didn't know about when you came up with it. Right. That's very surprising. So it's surprising to a certain extent okay. because, because physicists are really good at picking the bits of mathematics that are useful. Sure. There are all sorts of mathematics that are completely useless to physics, they're not picked. So I wouldn't jump to conclusions like that because I think at the very bottom of this question is the following question. What comes before, mind or reality? Okay, so what I think- What does that mean, mind or reality? I'll, 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 okay. So the people that say that mathematics is the language, is the code of nature, they're basically saying that there is mind 
before everything else, there is sort of like almost like some sort of metaphysical plan to reality, which is that mathematics is the fundamental blueprint of everything that exists, right? And and we are just discovering that stuff, sure. right? Because it's just there. We're just plucking Most the fruit. Most mathematicians we've talked to have said that. They yeah, said that the, the pure we're not, mathematicians. We're not, we're not this making business, this up. We this are this discovering it. And you yeah. don't think that? Yeah, I think it's true. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's true, but I don't agree with that. Yeah. You know, I think that first comes reality. It comes not just reality, but the parts of reality that we can observe. Then our minds try to make sense of what's going on, creating concepts which are useful to us, mm. right? And so, for example, if you go way before mathematics was something like that, if you were like a hunter-gatherer, you know, in some forest, and you couldn't distinguish between, you know, the, the brush and a panther, you die. Right? So clearly pattern recognition was incredibly important to the survival of humanity way before there was mathematics. Yeah. Right? So our brains were molded in such a way to favor certain things over other things so that we could thrive in an environment which mm -hmm. was very hostile. Right? One of them was the notion of pattern recognition. The other one was the notion of ordering. Right? So you wanted to order things, you order space, you order time. Right, and um, so we created this mathematics, and hand, and then the science based on this mathematics because it was very useful to us, right? And so to me, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use our minds to describe the portions of reality that we can, that, and then of course as we evolve as a species and we learn more about reality, we pluck more math and more math and more math to do that job. Right? And so there is a very productive symbiotic relationship between our minds and reality. But the notion that there is a grand plan in nature, which is mathematical, right? and we're just trying to uncover that, sounds to me very crypto-religious. You know, it's very much like some sort of medieval cult that God was this supreme mathematician and the jobs of scientists is essentially to kind of uncover the truth with capital T, which is really reading the mind of God, so you to speak. Don't, you don't like that? I, I don't love, like I love that. the idea that you're part of a medieval it's cult. This, yeah. is, this is great. This day is getting better and better. And so... Be careful when we late at night. <laughs> but, you know, in the, at the end, you know... But you, don't like the, but you don't like it because it, you think... Um, it smacks too much of religion. I don't think we need that. Okay. You see, I don't think we need that in order mm. to make sense of it. Even if we, as you were saying, we create the beginnings of mathematics, isn't it, once you've created it, there, is, there are a whole load of consequences which will flow from that first stuff, which in, a, in some sort of theoretical sense, all of those consequences of what you started with, they're already there, and you are now going to discover them. Mm -hmm. So there is a process of discovering. We, we, in other words, you, we, we're not free to make up the next bit of mathematics any old way. The Once next it, bit of mathematics yeah. is already decided because of how the, the few things we invented at the beginning. So in that sense, we really are. So you could forgive people for going, for thinking, my God, that was there before I got there. It was waiting for me. Because in some sense, it really was. It didn't need to be put there by God, did it? It was just a consequence of the, the first few ideas that we had. Could you argue the same way about music? Uh, precisely, I would say yes. Because you know, music is hey, once you have the notes, everything else follows. So any species that is intelligent enough to understand that there are musical scales can come up with all the symphonies uh. that uh, because they're just waiting there to be discovered, right? Yeah. And and I think they are not. They're just being created by this very clever neuronal network that we have in our heads. You know that. Um, that allow us to do these wonderful things. I think, let me put no, it another no, way. No, okay, I think on. that to say that everything is out there. Not saying and, everything. But a lot of it is, yeah. or some of it is yeah. out there. Yeah. And that we're just, it's sort of taking away from how amazing humans are. 